Thank you. Thank you, Doug, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. I feel like I'm home with friends. I've, I know so many of you, even though it's been quite a while since I've been here. And it's nice to see uh, Judith here, Kolokov, who, who hosted me last time I was here about four years ago. We drove around the state uh, together and gave a lot of talks in a lot of places. And the talk that I gave in Seattle, uh, some of you may know, was filmed, put on YouTube, and over the last four years has more than three million views. You know, so that's pretty, that's pretty cool. So that's one thing that's happened over the last four years. We've got a lot of people viewing this, um, this talk, well, that talk, which is good. Um, the book just came out in second edition, which is very nice. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what's new. There's several things that are new in the second edition. There's an epilogue, basically, that talks about the last four years. Um, and I'll touch all that just a little bit as well. So it's been a busy four years. And the reason I'm I initially came to Seattle was to sit with Doug. Uh, he's helping me very generously um, kind of edit and work on the second book that, I'm, that, that should be out sometime next year. So that's all, um, you know, that's all been coming up. That's all been happening over the last four years. It's interesting. I've been listening to the issue of Palestine, of course, from the very different perspectives. And, of course, now with the elections coming up, um, people talk about the lesser evil. And I'm sure many of the people here feel that they prefer the lesser evil. And maybe some don't. Uh, on the issue, on our issue, on, the, on this issue of Palestine, on the issue of foreign policy, it doesn't seem like the lesser evil is a lesser evil at all. Uh, we're looking at President Obama about to sign an agreement to give Israel $44 billion over the next 10 years, which is more than Israel has been getting so far. Um, they're still negotiating. My understanding is that Israel, that the Americans, the, the administration wants there to be a, an item in the agreement where Israel will not go back to Congress and ask for more money over these 10 years. And the Israelis are not agreeing to this. And the way things have been going, I have a feeling the Israelis are going to win this. So they're going to get the commitment for $44 billion. Plus, they will, if they feel like, go back to Congress and ask for more money. Um, besides that, of course, uh, Israel is, uh, the US is supporting its staunch allies, the wonderful democracies like Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Uh, and so forth, and this is, uh, this, is, this is a foreign policy that we can expect to continue, whether it's the greater evil or the lesser evil. Um, so I think our work as people who care, people of conscience, people who are activists is cut out for us because it's, nothing is going to change unless we work harder. And I think all of us that have been involved in this issue know, can you know, agree that over the last five, six, seven years there has been there have been great changes here in the United States, um, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. Um, and one sign that there has been big changes here in the United States is the fact that in Israel, the Israeli press and the Israeli government are f afraid now and discussing how is it that the threat of the BDS the BDS is the title they give to all the, you know, Palestine solidarity work. The BDS has reached the shores of our great friend America, and the BDS is now spreading in colleges and spreading like fire through the churches, and oh my goodness, what are we going to do? They had a conference in Jerusalem a couple months ago. I just happened to be in town, so I signed up and I attended. And I have to tell you, it was, it was unbelievable. It's like, live, it's like walking into this, you know, some kind of a bubble where people have, com have absolutely no connection to the outside world. So they had everybody from the president of the state of Israel, who is really the village fool. He's got to be the stupidest man in the Middle East. But he's the president of the state of Israel. And they had cabinet ministers and um, Mossad operatives and military experts and all kinds of diplomats and journalists and the entire day and thousands and thousands of participants. This is in Jerusalem, thousands of participants. And the entire day was focused on how we, the Israelis, have done nothing wrong. We are good, peace-loving people. All this anti-Semitism has now a new name, which is called Palestine Solidarity and BDS. 
and we need to do more to combat this. And every, almost every speaker, and there were a lot of speakers, it was a very long day, almost every speaker began by saying, um, you know, this is a threat to our existence. We need to treat this just like we treat any other terrorist threat. The Mossad has not yet pulled out all of its arsenal. And then they ended with saying, yes, but this is nothing. We're strong. We're fine. Nobody can hurt us. We're doing great. Every single speech was like that. Sometimes they switched the order around. So clearly, clearly they're concerned, and that's a good thing. Another thing is that uh, Israeli uh, news channel, uh, channel TV News, did a four or five part series on the BDS reaching the shores of America. And they came and they interviewed uh, several activists, they interviewed me, they interviewed you, um, they interviewed college uh, kids on college campuses, activists, and their thing was we have a serious PR problem and we're not dealing with it. This was the message. Uh, we have people like, uh, well, mo they, they focused mostly on how is it that so many Jewish people are supporting the BDS in America. Uh, young, younger generation, older generation, but Jewish people are supporting this and how severe this is, but it's always, the problem is always portrayed as, or framed as a PR problem. We're just not explaining our position well enough. Therefore, there's BDS, therefore, there's the Palestine Solidarity, and so on. Um, because we, we as Israel, never do anything wrong. You know, the occupation is not an occupation, the Palestinians are not our problem, and so on and so forth. So this is a reality that we're going to be seeing uh, moving into these next elections and beyond. And again, regardless, and I believe this very firmly, regardless of who ends up being the president and who ends up being the Secretary of State, we, as activists, as people of conscience, the burden is on us to bring about change. And I think a lot has been done over the last five, six years, but certainly not enough, certainly not enough for the people who lived in Gaza and just had to live through another nightmare with Israeli uh, planes or American planes uh, flown by Israeli pilots uh, bombing them again. Um, so that's... Um, that's kind of where we stand. And again, I encourage everybody to become more involved and work even harder um, in order to bring about the change that we need. And I'll talk about what that change should look like or what I think it should look like tonight. Um, there's a question that I think is, um, needs to be addressed. Um, and that question is this whole issue of is it Israel or is it Palestine? Or is it Israel and Palestine? And is Israel and Palestine in one place or two? And I think a lot of people kind of struggle and wrestle with how do we define, where, 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 what do we call the place? Because usually people will say, well, I've been to Israel and I've been to Palestine. Well, what does that mean? Um, or uh, this thing happened in Israel and that thing happened in Palestine. And where is exactly is Israel and where exactly is Palestine? And why are we talking about it as though these are two places? I think it's... Are we ha <laughs> I do realize we're having a wedding here as well. Okay. So is it one country or two? I think everybody here is. By the way, how many people here have been there? Whatever you choose to call it. Okay, so most of you know what I'm talking about. So is it one country or two? I think the answer is clear. It's one country with two names. I don't think that's a secret anymore. All of it is Israel, if you call it that, but certainly all of it was Palestine. Um, is it a war? Is it a war that's taking place there, or is it a struggle for freedom and justice? We have to define these things so that we are clear about how we move forward. Um, now, how do we resolve this, whatever it is, if it's a war, or if it's a struggle, do we resolve it through peace talks, or do we resolve it first through resistance? Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Matt Gilbert, the doctor, the Norwegian doctor, anybody know who Matt Gilbert is? Okay, you should, if, he, if you ever have a chance to watch his talks on YouTube or, or when he's in town or if he's in the country, go listen to him speak. Um, he's a doctor, a Norwegian doctor that worked for many, many years on and off uh, in Gaza, in southern Lebanon, with Palestinian refugees and so on. And recent, he was there during the two, 2014 attack on Gaza and then he left and when he wanted to come back, Israel didn't let him go back into Gaza. He's banned. 
And I meet him in many places. I met him recently in, in, uh, in Iceland. And we're talking, and he said, it's interesting how people frame the conflict. Or, <laughs> here I did it again. Frame the, what is happening, the reality in Palestine, and they call it a conflict. He said, if anybody in Norway defined the German occupation as the German-Norwegian conflict, they would be thrown out of the room. But here we have no problem calling it the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Some even call it a war. So it's important that we define for ourselves what it is and then express it like that. Express it clearly. And then move on and act, do whatever we need to do in order to bring it to a resolution. But as long as we waver, it's Israel, it's Palestine. Well, if I'm in Ramallah, I'm in Palestine. But if I'm in Jerusalem, am I in Israel? Or am I in Tel Aviv? Is it Israel or Palestine? Is Tel Aviv a settlement or is only Kiryat Arba a settlement? You know, all these questions are, I know that a lot of people have them in their mind and, and they're not always as clear as they should be. So I think we need to be very clear about what it is that's going on, how we express it, how we talk about it, and then what we're going to do if we care enough to do something to bring about change. Um, I really like that hat that, I mean, you may have seen it. You know Donald Trump's hat, Make America Great Again? So somebody did a hat, the exact same red hat with, with uh, white lettering, Make Israel Palestine Again. <laughs> and I find it, I, I really like that. I think, uh, I think that works very, very well. Because Palestine was a place of tolerance, and Israel is a place of intolerance. Um, and that's just to keep it short. So in order to try to make it clear, what is going on today? What happened? How did it start? I think we need to sum it up for ourselves. I'll try to sum it up tonight. So we all know it began, or something began in 1948. Now when people talk about the occupation of Palestine, they usually talk about 1967. And the, the discussion, the narrative is always, well, the occupation of 1967. The Palestinian occupied territories are the part of Palestine that were occupied in 1967. Some people are talking about next year, in, in 2017, the 50th anniversary of the occupation. So what happened in 1948? Between 1948 and 1967, that area in which Israel was established, what about that? Is it gone? Disappeared? Millions of refugees? Hundreds and hundreds of towns and villages destroyed? Was that just, I don't know, just, just empty land that the Jews came and, and made blossom? Is that really what it is? So I, have to, I think it's important to be clear, the occupation of Palestine began in 1948. And we are going to be commemorating next year, not the 50th, but the 70th year of the occupation of Palestine. Now, something did happen in 1967, of course, but it wasn't the beginning of the occupation, it was the completion of the occupation. In 1967, Israel completed, finished the job of the occupation of Palestine. And when you listen, to what the Israeli generals of 1967, among whom my father was a member, the way they talk about the, uh, what happened in 1967, they define it as finishing the job. Finishing the job. Because they couldn't finish it in 1948 for reasons that had more to do with internal politics of the Zionist movement and the new state of Israel than anything else. So they waited 20 years. And then those two little parts that were left out, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, or three parts, and the Gaza Strip were taken in 1967. But it wasn't the beginning of the occupation. It was the completing of the, uh, completion of the occupation of Palestine. That's what happened in 1967. And again, if we have that clear, then it's, again, we can move forward to the next step. But as long as we're wavering about this, oh, this is Israel, and this is not Israel. How is it not Israel? Yaffa, and Haifa, and the Nakab Desert, and the Galilee, and all these places. None of them are Palestine? And the millions of refugees who are in refugee camps all over, all around Palestine, where do they come from? What are they called? They're all Palestinians and they all came from Palestine. Now, what the 1967 war allowed Israel to do is to finalize the creation or the establishment of a Jewish state or a state 
with exclusive rights for Jewish people. They like to call it a Jewish state. I don't know what, Jewish is, what is Jewish about it. But it is a state that offers exclusive rights to Jewish people in Palestine. In other words, they completed the job of establishing a state for Jews in Palestine. That's what they did in 1967. And from that moment on, it was all one state. The discussion, one state, two state, is absolutely absurd. It's absolutely absurd because Israel has established a single state all over Palestine by design. It wasn't like it happened by mistake. It was, it was, it was, done, it was done by design, well, very thoroughly planned. And if anybody has any doubts, all you have to do is see what happened immediately after they occupied the West Bank and East Jerusalem. One of the first orders that were given by the army is that the water in the West Bank, and the West Bank is one of the largest water uh, sources, it's the, it's the mountain aquifer. One of the first orders given by the army is that the water belongs to Israel. The water belongs to Israel. That was one of the first things that was, that was, that was um, made absolutely clear by the military. And then immediately, immediately, as the guns were still smoking, they began destroying Palestinian towns, forcing hundreds of thousands of Palestinians into exile, and building for Jews only, which is exactly what they did 20 years earlier in the other parts of Palestine. And of course today there is no difference. When you talk to Israelis, there is no difference. It's all Israel. And we have a problem because there's a bunch of Palestinians here and there stuck in our throats, but basically it's all Israel. And when you look at Israeli maps, nature maps, weather maps, any kind of maps, school book maps, geography maps, it's all Israel. There's very little mention, if at all, of any Palestinian existence. So again, we need to have this clear in our minds so that we can move forward with this issue. So we don't have these strange conflicts. Um, I'm going to give you a little, um, oh, and this of course what they did with Palestine. Cross it off the map. So I'll tell you a little bit about what's, what's, what I did in the last four years and what's, um, what I talk about in the epilogue, in the new edition. Um, probably the most, I don't know if the most significant, but in terms of my activism and my work, one of the more significant things that I was able to do was to finally visit Gaza. Now I tried to visit Gaza several times. But there's a problem for me because I'm an Israeli national and Israeli law does not allow Israelis to enter Gaza. So I tried a few times to go in through Egypt. But the Egyptian authorities are not much better than the Israeli authorities when it comes to Gaza and I wasn't able to go through. And then uh, one day I got a message on Facebook from a Facebook friend, somebody I'd never met before, asking me, asking me if I would consider visiting Gaza, entering Gaza through the subway or using the subway. Um, and it didn't take me very long to figure out what they're talking about. So I said, yes, of course. Now, to go from Jerusalem to Gaza is maybe an hour and 15 minute drive. Maybe an hour and a half at the most. Um, but this is what I had to do. I had to go to get up in Jerusalem, go to Tel Aviv, from Tel Aviv, I had to fly to Elat in the very south. Then I had to cross the border into Egypt, into Sinai, which is where I met some people who were picking me up. And we had to drive to Rafah, which is where the tunnels are, or which the subways are. Uh, this is where they still had sub, they still had tunnels then. This is a couple of years ago. Um, but on the way out of si into Sinai, there are Egyptian um, checkpoints. And the Egyptian officers at that particular checkpoint didn't feel like letting us go north the way we should have gone. They said, no, you can only go south towards the resorts and the hotels. And there was nothing anybody could do. I mean, you can't argue with them and you can't just go anywhere. You have to have a permit to go anywhere you go. So we're going south and what are we going to do? We can't argue with a guy. But luckily the driver discovered that if he goes far enough south, then there's a road that he can take that eventually goes and meets the road that goes north. So it was supposed to take about three, four hours. It took us 14 hours. So by then, I don't know, we're sitting in Rafah already. And by the way, Rafah 
on the Egyptian side, I think it's probably even worse than Rafah on the Palestinian side, on the Gaza side. It's beyond belief. Uh, the poverty, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's poor, it's, it's horrible. So we're sitting in somebody's home waiting for the permission to go in through the tunnel. And I'm looking at the clock, it's about 10 o'clock at night. I left home uh, in Jerusalem about 7 o'clock and I'm realizing that this could have taken me an hour and 15 minutes. I would have been in Gaza, it was 14 hours, I wasn't even there yet. And then we got the permission to go, so we go into, we drive in a car in all these alleys, we stop by, by some house and they open a gate, we go into the backyard and we go in through this tunnel. And this is what they consider a five-star tunnel because you can walk, you know, you don't have to crawl, there's lights, you see there's wood panels, so it's quite comfortable. And it's a maybe three, four minute walk and on the other side, there's a guy sitting on a stool checking your passport. <laughs> and you've entered Gaza and I've entered Gaza. So that was, um, and it's interesting because the, that part of the Sinai Desert is, is the Wild West. It's completely the Wild West. There is no law, there's no order. So you've got all these Bedouin groups walking around with AK-47, stopping traffic, checking out what you want. It happened to us on the way. It's, it's, it's hair-raising. But once you get into Gaza, once you get back into Palestine, it's like, oh, thank God. You know? And this is Gaza, okay? The only concern I had really was in Egypt with the, with, because the, with the Egyptian authorities and also with the lack of you know, sense of security. You don't know what the, what, what, what's going to happen. Um, and then, of course, the Israelis, who knows what they're going to do. But in terms of being in Gaza and being with Palestinians, it was, it was comforting. It was very nice. As nice as it could be in Gaza. Um, and this is just the street, you know, the horse-drawn carriage, the, and there's graffiti everywhere. And the graffiti behind this horse is Kataib al Qassam, which is the Qassam Brigades, the Al Qassam Brigades, the, the vicious enemy. The Kassam Brigades. And this is a picture, it speaks for itself. This was on, the, on a gate going into a school. And it says, no weapons allowed. And I thought there's something funny about this. I'm not quite sure, but you know, in, you're in Gaza and it says, no weapons allowed. And of course, they're being bombed all over the place, you know. Um, now, speaking of Gaza, I think that's another thing that needs to be made as clear as humanly possible. Israeli attacks on Gaza did not begin in 2008 or 2006 or 2005 or whenever it is that they became, you know, a topic of discussion. Israeli attacks on Gaza began as soon as the Gaza Strip was established. Now some of you may recall the Gaza, the, the the process of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine of 1948 actually continued until the early 1950s and then they needed a place to which they could herd all these all these Palestinian refugees and a line was drawn in the center of you know it was drawn there was an area in the center of which was the city of Gaza and that is the Gaza Strip there's nothing natural about the Gaza Strip as a strip you know Israel drew a line and said this is where we're gonna push all these people and that was it overnight there was a Gaza Strip and pretty, this is the early 1950s, and pretty much as soon as the Gaza Strip was established, again in the early 1950s, Israeli commandos began attacking the attacking Gaza Strip. Now, there was nothing there. Poor refugees. But the narrative, the story, what Israelis were told is about these bloodthirsty, vicious Arabs who are now looking at us, wanting to tear us apart because we took their land. And therefore, Israeli commandos, and these are pictures from then, this is the, there was a special unit that you may have heard of, Unit 101. Ariel Sharon was the commander of that unit as a young officer, and he's in this picture. Uh, kind of chubby looking guy. Um, and this is them just coming out right after what they called an operation, which is basically a massacre. They would go in and they would just, with what they called punitive uh, operations to punish the people of Gaza. Perhaps somebody came in, they were infiltrators, so you had to punish them for that. Sometimes they'd come in and commit acts of resistance, uh, perhaps kill someone, an Israeli, and so on. So then these guys would go in and commit terrible massacres and come out. So that was in the early 50s. You know, and then it went on, the 50s, through the 60s, through the 70s. Then they started calling them Fedayeen, then they started calling them terrorists. Today they call them Hamas. 
There's always a name for this devil that lives in Gaza. And of course, today the attacks look more like this. Actually, this is old. Now they've got the F-35s. The F-35 is the most, you know, cutting edge flagship uh, uh, warplane. And Israel has them now. I think the first ones arrived about six months ago or so. And apparently they just used them on this latest attack in Gaza. Somebody tweeted out of Gaza that they managed to have 30 raids, 30 raids, so 30 flyovers in 15 minutes. And God knows how many bombs were dropped. So this is what it looks like today. And of course, this is the result. Now, there are two things that happen which I think are interesting. Number one, this is happening five minutes, not, not even five minutes, from Israeli towns where people live like this, you know. And I'm in touch with quite a few people in Gaza, activists and writers and so on. And you try to go on Skype and talk, but then now there's no electricity. Uh, or now suddenly there's a bombing, or suddenly something has happened, and you don't know what's going to happen. Of course, there's no clean water, no access to proper food or medicine. And then this happens. And the second thing is, people, nobody asks why. Why is this happening? Why is Israel so determined to destroy Gaza? What is it about Gaza that is so scary? There has never been a threat to Israel from Gaza. There's never been an army in Gaza. There's never been a tank in Gaza. What is the obsession? Why does Israel constantly, constantly attack Gaza? Nobody seriously thinks. Nobody seriously thinks or believes there is a threat to Israel from Gaza. The other day they reported that the reason for the Israeli attack was that the Qassam rocket was heard being fired into Sderot. So they had to go and look for the rocket. And they had like, you know, emergency, emergency crews, uh, yeah, emergency crews looking for where this thing fell. You know, in Gaza, when Israel shoots rockets, you don't have to look for it. It's right there. You can see it. You know, so nobody seriously thinks or believes that there's any threat to Israel from Gaza. There never has been. So what is the obsession? And I think the answer to that is the fact that the existence, the existence of this human tragedy points very clearly to the fact that there is no legitimacy to the state of Israel. That a state that is, that whose existence created such a humanitarian catastrophe, such a horrible tragedy, and we're not talking about a thousand or ten thousand or even fifty thousand. We're talking about two million people. Five minutes away from Israeli cities where everybody's living like this. Perfectly fine. You wouldn't dream of not having water in the tap or electricity when you turn on the light. So there are only two options. One option, open the gates, allow people, the refugees, to return to their homes pay to rebuild what was destroyed and create a normal kind of existence. But we can't do that because Israel doesn't want the Arabs back. We don't call them Palestinians, we just say Arabs. In, in Hebrew, Arabs is kind of demeaning. It's almost like saying nigger. Almost. So we don't want them back. Doing nothing is not an option because people are going to ask questions. So we kill them bomb them and blame them for being terrorists and it works beautifully it works absolutely beautifully the world eats it up Israel is bombing and bombing and bombing murdering innocent civilians on prime time in one of the most highly visible places on earth and everybody in America and everybody in Europe talks about Israel defending itself self-defense from what self-defense from what Self-defense. End of story. The Europeans, everybody here in the U.S., every talking head, every politician, it's self-defense. It's fine. And they're getting away with it. And this is the obsession. And it's not going to end. It is not going to end until the entire issue is resolved. It's not going to end until the entire issue is resolved. And I'll tell you what that means, what I think it means in just a second. But of course, Gaza is not the only place where there's a problem. You know, life in Jerusalem is absolutely horrifying for Palestinians. Some Palestinians even say that it's worse in Jerusalem than it is in Gaza. 
Because at least in Gaza, they don't have to deal with the soldiers and the Israelis all day long and every day. So you've got young men being stopped and frisked all the time and everywhere and any time and arrested. Of course, we have them shot and killed also constantly at any time and place that the soldiers feel like pulling the trigger. Um, we have this new nonsense called uh, child terrorists. So this is one such child terrorist that was shot by the Israelis so badly that they had to amputate his leg. He's 13 years old. So we went to visit him at Hadassah Hospital. Can you imagine a th just even saying a 13-year-old terrorist? And until we came, he was actually handcuffed to the bed. Now his leg is destroyed. He can't walk, let alone run. But he's chained, he's, he's handcuffed to the bed. And just a little before, before we came to visit him, they decided, okay, well, maybe we don't need to handcuff him to the bed anymore. You know? It's an absurd, an absurd, an absurdly violent reality that Palestinians have to endure. This is the road to Hebron. I'm sure many of you have been to Hebron. You've gone through the road, the, that famous Etzion intersection. So the last time I was there, this is just a couple months ago. So they always have a lot of soldiers there because it's an intersection where many of the most vicious settlers live. And, many, and there are many Palestinian towns and, and villages there. Of course, this is leading to Hebron. Now, not only is there a heavy army presence and but now they have actual snipers at about eight or ten points around this intersection. And I don't know if you can see that very well. They're actual snipers sitting with their eye on the side and their finger on the trigger all the time at eight or ten points all around this intersection, ready to pull the trigger. Now, they're not looking for somebody who looks like me, so when I drive there, I'm relatively safe. But you can imagine what it must be when you're a Palestinian trying to drive through, and you have to drive through there. This is the road that leads everywhere. This is really the main intersection going into the southern part of the West Bank. Now, the reality for Palestinians, you know, we usually talk about Palestinians in the West Bank or Gaza. There are the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, the Palestinians of 1948, which very rarely is talked about. There's an excellent book by Ilan Pape, who I understand is coming to visit, that very few people know about and I strongly recommend. It's called The Forgotten Palestinians. And it's about the reality of the Palestinians who remained on the land and became Israeli citizens. You know, the reality in which they live is so different than the reality in which Israeli citizens, Jewish citizens live, that, that there's no way for, for, anybody to, for Israelis to even know that this exists. The best comparison, and this is a comparison that Elon Pape makes in the book, and is very, very, um, it's very accurate. It's, 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 he says, the model under which, by which they live is the same model by which Arab regimes or Arabs in other countries live in their regimes. Their life is completely controlled by the Israeli secret police, by the Shabak. Every permit, every movement, every step, every application, they have to go through the Israeli secret police, and they really are in charge of their life. Never mind the, the laws, dozens of laws that discriminate against them and so forth. So that's the reality of the Palestinians inside of 1948. It's a choking, restrictive life. And again, the forgotten Palestinians, I strongly recommend. Um, but what I think is even less talked about is the reality in which Palestinians live and Muslims and Arabs live here in this country. And that is the topic, like uh, Doug was saying, of my next book about the Holy Land Foundation. The reason I talk about the prosecution of that particular organization is because the Holy Land Foundation was the largest Muslim charity in America. It was a highly regarded, highly respected, highly successful charity organization. Respected all around the world. Led and run by people who were respected all across the country and in the Arab world. Um, and bringing them down caused such damage to the Muslim and Arab and Palestinian community in America that is, again, it has to be told. It's a story that people have to, have to it has to be told. Um, 
the purpose of the establishment of the, or the purpose, the main purpose of the Herland Foundation was to provide aid to Palestinian refugees, Palestinian orphans, and this is, this is coming from people who are immigrants themselves, came to America, made a life for themselves, developed a community, and now felt like it was time to give back. It was time to give back to the old country. And God only knows Palestinians, not only in Palestine, but in refugee camps around Palestine, uh, needed this. Um, but they didn't only focus on that. They helped Palestinians, they helped uh, people around the world besides that. Um, when they were closed, when they were closed down, they were closed down after 9-11. George W. Bush in December of, of, uh, of uh, 2001, just after 9-11, uh, came out and said, declared that this was a terrorist funding network, and that we finally closed down the major terrorist funding network. Their assets were seized. Um, later on, they were, they were prosecuted, and now they're in jail. Um, and in one affidavit, a uh, social worker from Gaza was trying to describe how important they were to the community. Uh, they didn't help Hamas. They didn't deal with terrorism. They didn't do any of that nonsense. And he was saying that the HLF has been able to significantly alleviate the suffering of thousands of Palestinians. Now, what they did was not only help the Palestinians who were poor, but they were using local merchants. They were using local uh, food, local merchandise. So they created an economy in a place where things were very, very severe. The reality was very severe. And when you had the Intifada, the, up, the uprising, and when you had all kinds of issues, problems that were coming up, thousands were arrested, many, many were killed, they were supplying a much needed aid for these people. Um, and then when they were closed down, that was it. So merchants weren't being paid, people didn't get, students didn't get their scholarships, poor didn't get the food aid, and so forth. Um, and it was a major, major blow to people in Palestine who are in need and to the Arab and Muslim community here in the United States. Um, and just to give you a list of the places and the, 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 the events and, and tragedies in which they uh, gave aid. New York in 9-11, they were there. Oklahoma City bombing, they were there. Flooding in Oklahoma and Iowa, they were there. The LA uprising, they were there. Uh, they had a food, um, they had like a soup kitchen in Patterson, New Jersey, and then all over the world. Earthquakes and floods and war and so forth. They were always there to help, which is why they gained a lot of respect around the world. Um, and what's interesting about the process of criminalizing them and bringing them down is that the people who were behind this created a reality in which charity to Palestinians is considered supporting terrorism. Now, how do you do that? How do you create this narrative? How do you twist things around in a way that charity is equated with supporting terrorism? It doesn't make sense. Well, this is how. For example, this is two, there are two, two, two examples. One is the word shaheed, the word martyr. When they were helping orphans, then, or in order to, for people, for, you know, for them to give aid to orphans, they were given lists of children with all the details, the, their age, the family situation, income, how the father died, and so on. Well, in Arab culture, you don't say that somebody died in vain. So very often, people are called a martyr when they die, regardless of how they died. But martyr is almost like a term of respect for somebody who died. They died for some cause. Nobody dies in vain. So all of the names of the, of these, of the father, all the description of the fathers were that they died as martyrs. Well, the definition that Israel gave martyr and the definition that was accepted here in the United States for Shahid martyr is suicide bomber. And they said, you see, they are helping the children of suicide bombers. They're encouraging suicide bombers because by giving the money, they're encouraging the fathers to go and blow themselves up to give their kids money. You see that? It turns out, out of about 194 Palestinian suicide bombers, not one Palestinian suicide bomber had children. Not a single Palestinian suicide bomber had children. 
But why ruin this great story with the facts? These were young men and a few women who had no ties, who had no family, who had no children. Now you have to put the genie back in the box. It's too late. They already said, Shaheed means martyr, means suicide bomber. Now they're also helping the families of prisoners. Israel has thousands and thousands of Palestinian prisoners, particularly during the Intifada. The number grows. Why are they in prison? Because they're terrorists. Israel doesn't imprison just anyone. They are in prison because they're terrorists and now these guys are giving money to their families to encourage them to become terrorists with money. This is the narrative. Never mind the fact that according to Israeli sources, according to Israeli sources, the vast majority of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails have never been charged with acts of violence. They're political prisoners. The vast majority have never been charged with acts of violence. And we're talking about the military court, where the bar is set very low. But again, why ruin a great story with the facts? And when the trial is in the northern district of Texas, and the jury sees a bunch of guys with beards, and they have Israeli experts, Anonymous Israeli intelligence experts who were brought in order to testify saying, oh yeah, these guys, they're all Hamas. They're all terrorists. End of story. So that's how they do it. Now, <clears throat> as part of the process of learning about this uh, case over the last few years, I went and met with the lawyers who defended them. Um, and John Boyd, he's an attorney out of Albuquerque, defended them. And this is a quote from him. And he said, please quote me on this. And this is not the worst thing he said about the judicial system and about the process. He says, the entire judicial system was taken hostage. The Constitution, laws, and government agency regulations were suspended. Pressure by Israel, post-9-11 hysteria, and the cowardice of the judiciary were behind this. And he said things that are far worse that I am going to put in the book, of course. Um, but judge after judge, appellate court after appellate court, saw that things were wrong, saw that the evidence against them was nonsense, but said, yes, but the government said it's national security, so off we go. You know. And because of this, five men are in jail. Three of them I already met in prison. I was supposed to meet a fourth one, but the prison authorities, for some reason, took away my permission to visit him. It's a very complicated process. This is Abdurrahman Oudeh. He was in uh, New Jersey, working in New Jersey, got 15 years. This is uh, Mufid Abdul Qadir. He, has the, he is the brother of Khaled Mash'al, who is the political head of Hamas. Um, he really did not even work for the Holy Land Foundation. He was just a volunteer who would show up at events, but it's a good story because of his brother. So he's in there for 20 years. Shukri Abu Bakr, was the, who was basically the CEO, uh, he got 65 years, 65 years. And the two other ones, Ghassan Elashi, also got 65 years. And Mohammed Al Zain, who's actually from San Diego, got 15 years. Now all of these guys are, you know, I'm 54, the youngest one among them is 57. So when you're 57 and you get 65 years in prison, or even 20 years in prison, that's a lot. So this is a story that Americans need to come to, to understand because the, I think there's a sense in America still, even today, that the judiciary is kind of unaffected, uncorrupted. Maybe it has some problems, but basically it's not the, like the politicians. But it's not true. The long reach, and I know this sounds maybe a little strange, but the long reach of the Israeli lobby and the Israeli pro-Israeli groups in America have tainted and contaminated the judicial system. And the Holy Land Foundation case is only one. It's only one of many cases. But I think it's the most, it's, it's the most important because it was the biggest. So that's what the next book's going to be about. Now there's this issue, uh, Doug and I talk about this on the way, you know, there's this issue of um, we are all against violence and so we should all talk and we are all for dialogue and we're all for sitting together and and discussing in dialogue and so forth God forbid that anybody would talk about resistance God forbid that the Palestinians would dare 
to stand up and resist. God forbid that they would dare tell Jews that they don't want them in their country. Let alone from time to time maybe try to kill a soldier who is there illegally, who is there in order to kill them. Resistance is not for Palestinians. Palestinians are allowed to be victims and they're allowed to be terrorists. But God forbid that they would be resistance, uh, fighters of resistance, or that they would be heroes. You know, in 2014, Israel put in a lot of ground troops into the Gaza Strip. Too many. So the casualty count became pretty high. 65, 67. So then they began to pull back. And when you hear the stories of the young Palestinians who are fighting on the ground, if they were not Palestinians, they would be heralded as heroes. We would know every single one of them by name. But Palestinians are not allowed to be heroes. They're only allowed to be terrorists. And when they kill an Israeli soldier, they're terrorists. And if they abduct an Israeli soldier, then they're kidnappers. You don't kidnap a soldier, you kidnap a child. But that's the reality. So God forbid that Palestinians would be engaged in resistance, and God forbid that we would support it. Because all Palestinian resistance is terrorism, and if we say that, God forbid. And there's a great quote from Franz Fanon that I like to uh, show, and I think it's important to realize because it, it fits this situation so perfectly. It fits the reality that Israel has, has created so perfectly. He says that colonialism is not a machine capable of thinking. It's not a body endowed with reason. The idea that we can negotiate with the state of Israel for peace is science fiction. It's science fiction. And he says, colonialism is naked violence and only gives in when confronted with greater violence. The 20-year brutal occupation of southern Lebanon only ended because Hezbollah was able to kick the Israeli army out more than once. But Hezbollah are terrorists, so we can't say that. But that's the only reason the occupation of southern Lebanon ended, is because Hezbollah's resistance, armed resistance, worked. The only reason the French left Algeria is because the Algerian resistance, very violent, worked. And there are other examples. So there's something to be said about this. Certainly here in America, they praise the revolution and how they fought to get the British out. So it's all, I guess it's a matter of geography if somebody's a terrorist or a freedom fighter. But I think what has happened over the last, I don't know, 50 or 60 years or so, is that we've learned something. And uh, the Indian experience, the black American experience, the experience of South Africa, and today the Palestinian experience, probably more than anything, have shown us that there are forms of resistance that are not armed, but are equally and perhaps even more effective than armed resistance. And all these examples have showed us this. I know people usually think of Palestinian resistance as terrorism but, or, or, via, or armed resistance, but the vast majority of Palestinian resistance has always been unarmed resistance. And this is what we know. We know about economic pressure. We know about political isolation. And we know about boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS. We know that it works. We know that it's principled. And we know that it's appropriate. And of course, we know that it's unarmed. In that interview, in this program that the Israeli News uh, did about the BDS here, um, the guy asked me, he said, but uh, some people would say that uh, BDS is very violent. <laughs> what do you say to that? <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> I don't want to say the word that you're supposed to say. You know, it's not appropriate. <laughs> what do you say? You know. That has to be the name of the game. Mario Cuomo in New York signed uh, an anti-BDS bill. There's a whole map now, I don't have it with me, but of states where BD, anti-BDS legislation passed. And New Jersey just passed, and funny, because next month I'm going to be in both states and I'm going to be speaking in state institutions. And they specifically asked me to talk about BDS, to violate these stupid laws. And of course, there's not a single activist who wouldn't be happy to be arrested for violating these stupid laws. So all these laws are doing is really energizing us energizing activists to promote BDS. 
Um, and another phenomenon that we see, that I've seen over the last few years, completely change the conversation on Palestine are students on campuses, Students for Justice in Palestine. Here they call them super, I think, right? Students for Justice in Palestine, these young student undergrads on campuses, have changed the way the issue of Palestine is discussed in this country, has given it legitimacy, and has pushed it through some very, very difficult obstacles. Not the least of which are the university administrators who don't know how to deal with them and wish they would all disappear, and they don't. You know, so every time I get an invitation or a call from somebody who's opening or, or a university that's starting an SJP uh, branch, you know, I try to do everything I can to support them, and I hope you guys would do the same. But this is the reality. This is all resistance. It's not solidarity. Students for Justice in Palestine is not solidarity. Going on a trip to um, uh, a company, young Palestinian kids in Hebron, is not solidarity. It is resistance. And it has to be viewed as resistance. Which is why so many accompaniment programs, when you, I'm sure many of you know this, when you come to Tel Aviv at the airport, you have to lie. You can't tell them why you're there. The more charitable the work, the more nonviolent it is, the more friendly it is, the more afraid they are at Tel Aviv airport that you would like to let you in. You know? This is all resistance, and I think we all need to view it as resistance. Resistance to apartheid, resistance to oppression, resistance to the brutality that exists in Palestine today. So, I think, I got, I'm almost done here, but I think there's one thing that we all are obliged to do. All of us who are sitting here, all of us who are, as they say, rich, free, and alive all at the same time. We are all obliged to find hope and pursue it. We, none of us, none of us have the luxury to say this is hopeless. None of us has the luxury to say there's nothing we can do. Because this, we are probably the richest and freest people on earth. And that we would say there's nothing we can do? Never mind the fact that our tax dollars, 10 million of them every single day go to Israel to oppress the Palestinians. So I think it's, a, it is, it's, it's, it's something we must take upon us, upon ourselves to do, is to find hope. And the question is this, where do we find hope? In an occupied Palestine with exclusive rights for people like me, which is what the state of Israel is, that bombs innocent civilians and kills them as a, as a matter of policy, that has racist laws, I don't know if you know this, Palestine, there are about 12 million people living in Palestine. Palestine slash Israel, I suppose, okay? 12 million people. Six, about 6.2 million of those are Palestinians, making the Palestinians a majority. And you can ask Ilan Papa about this when he comes. The majority, the Palestinians, are allocated 3% of the water in the country. Because Israel has its own water authority that governs the water supply and allocates water. Palestinians, who make up the majority of the people, are allocated 3% of the water. So you never know if you're going to have water in the tap. Or you may know that you have about 12 hours per week. And if you've been there, you know that across the street, across the street, literally, there is an Israeli town, a Jewish town, with green lawns and swimming pool. You wouldn't dream of being in a Jewish town where there's no water in the tap or taking a shower three times a day, if you want. This is Israel. There is no other Israel. I was talking to somebody, a J Street representative, the other day. You know, they have this idea of this pie in the sky, kind and generous, peace-loving Israel. It doesn't exist. It never existed. So, is there hope in that? That's a decision we all, that's something, a question we all need to answer for ourselves. Or perhaps we can find hope in a free, democratic Palestine. A Palestine with equal rights, a Palestine with respect for human rights, a Palestine with justice and freedom. Which of these two possibilities presents more hope? Because these are the only two options. In colonialism, with racism, you're either for it or you're against it.
There is no gray area. There's no gray area on these issues. We either oppose it or we support it. And here, particularly in the United States, if we do nothing, we support it. Here in America, if we do nothing about the injustice, we support it because it's our tax dollars. So which one of these two options presents hope? I would argue it's the second one. And I would argue that that is where we must focus all of our energy, all of our intelligence, all of our time, and all of our money on bringing, making, like I said earlier, making Israel Palestine again, establishing and, and, and replacing this racist apartheid regime that has been occupying Palestine for 70 years, seven decades into a democracy with equal rights. That needs to be the banner behind which we all stand. And I'm going to leave you with this image right here. These young Palestinian children live in a refugee camp. I took this picture. And I can promise you that none of us would be smiling if we lived in that camp. None of us would be smiling if we lived in that camp. None of us would be smiling if we even walked into that camp and spent five minutes there. But this is Palestine. Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian poet, said the Palestinians are infected with the um, incurable malady of hope. You know, and this is what this represents. And I really encourage you to wrap your heads around this idea of free Palestine. When we say, and I saw a bumper sticker on somebody's car, I liked it, like the one I have here. When we say free Palestine, what is a free Palestine? What does that mean? We have to be absolutely clear. What is a free Palestine? A free Palestine, I believe, means a Palestine without checkpoints, a Palestine with equal rights, a Palestine with no military presence, a Palestine without bombing, without racist laws. That is a free Palestine. A Palestine where everyone is free, as opposed to a Palestine where you have the prison and the prison guard. A Palestine where the refugees are welcome to return. A Palestine where Gaza is rebuilt. A Palestine where there's no ethnic cleansing. That is what a free Palestine means. And that is something, like I said, we need to wrap our heads around it. We need to stand behind that banner. And if we do that, if we do our job, if we do what we are supposed to do, then free Palestine can and will be a reality and very, very soon. Thank you very much. time for questions and answers, about 15, 20 minutes. Let me just preface that by saying, when I say questions, I mean questions. I don't mean speeches. On this subject, there's a great tendency to want to do that. So try to keep your questions to about 10, 15 seconds. Question. OK. Um, well, thank you for your concern about my personal safety. As far as I know, as far as I know, I'm fine. I'm safe. Um, I've never been threatened. If somebody wants to follow me or track me, it's very easy. Everything I do is public. My speeches are on YouTube. Everything I do, I post. So it's really not that hard to track me. And if they do track me, if that's, they want to spend their money and their resources on it, they're welcome to do so. Um, but I don't feel any, any threat. I, I think um, part of it has to do with the fact that the, part of it has to do with the fact that the, oh, I'm sorry. The reason I feel that um, my personal safety is not in any kind of, you know, there's no problem when I'm there, and you mean by the Israeli authorities, I'm, I'm assuming. You have been in prison too. Well, I haven't been, I've been arrested and I've been on trial, but this is only because I was at a protest causing as much trouble as I could. <laughs> and so, and so I have been arrested in protests in the West Bank. Um, I had a trial, I talk about the trial. Uh, also in the epilogue, um, but the, the, the racism in Israel is so deep that I think that is what keeps Israeli activists like myself safe, you know? Um, and that's, that's, that's a reality so far. So, you know, uh, there's, very little, there's very little punishment for, uh, Israeli, for Jewish activists.
I mean, even if we do go to trial, and I went to trial, I've been arrested many times, but I've been to trial once for an arrest that took place in 2012. The trial was last October, and they just, and we were acquitted. And then the prosecution, for some reason, decided to appeal, and I can't imagine why. But anyway, it's nonsense for us. It's really nothing. You know, if I was a Palestinian arrested in the same place at the same time, I would have been thrown in jail for as long as whoever the commander decided to keep me in jail. You know? So it's a very different reality. But yeah, I think, I think as Israelis, we're still very safe. Um, a Hillary presidency, in terms of Palestine, will only change if we make a change. Otherwise, it's going to be more of the same. Like I said earlier, President Obama is committing now $44 billion in foreign aid over the ten, next 10 years, which is absurd. Why does a fully developed country need foreign aid, get foreign aid anyway? And so much foreign aid. But anyway, so he's promised that. Um, it's a foreign policy that I believe will continue. It's a foreign policy that sees uh, monarchies, monarch dictators as our allies in Saudi Arabia and in Jordan, as our great, wonderful allies. It's a foreign, it's a foreign policy that says, on the one hand, we will not forsake our Egyptian friends, yet support the coup leader, the leader of a military coup, instead of supporting the democratically elected president who is in prison. So are we forsaking the Egyptian people or not? You know, and we know, and everybody knows very well that in Egypt, the military commanders take the foreign aid into their pockets. And they also get about $2 billion a year. Um, and that's not going to change. This is the vision of the foreign policy of a Hillary Clinton policy. It's not going to change unless we force it to change. Apartheid in South Africa would not have fallen unless people had forced it to fall. Jim Crow would not have ended unless there was a movement to end it. None of these P things are ever going to change top down. Never. Politicians will only do the right thing if they're absolutely forced to do so. And it's our job to force them to do so. So if you want, I personally think, and I may be going out on a limb here, but I personally think Hillary Clinton is going to be the last Zionist president. I really think that. I think this last uh, campaign, when the APAC convention took place in Washington, D.C., the candidates went, all but one, of course, all but Bernie, went, but with some reluctance. I think the four years from now, the next presidential cycle, I don't think they'll be going to speak at APAC anymore. Um, and I really think that Hillary is going to be the last one, but we're going to have to make it happen. It's not going to happen if we sit and do nothing. We can make it happen, and I believe, I believe the momentum is there, and I believe the movement is there, based on the changes that you know, we've seen over the last five, six years. But it's not going to happen on its own, and it can, be, it can change or not change based on what we do. But in terms of the vision of foreign policy, this is the vision of the foreign policy. You know, there used to be, I'll just give you another example. There used to be a group of countries that Israel defined as the refusal front. It was before the axis of evil, it was the refusal front. And that's what Israel called these countries. These were countries that refused to deal with Israel and refused to deal with the United States. Okay, you ready for the list? Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen. All of these countries are now in rubble. All of these countries are now destroyed. Okay, so there's a foreign policy here which is very, very dangerous to people, you know, to other people. Uh, and supports, definitely clearly supports a very myopic Israeli agenda. So I think we need to do something about that. And if we do, it'll be good for everybody. And if we don't, then I think things won't change. Um, You know, it's interesting. People, a lot of people don't realize what you just, what you, what the, the, the last question was about Zionism being a secular movement. You know, a lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people think that Zionism was actually kind of a religious Jewish thing. And that the people who represent Zionism are Orthodox Jews, which of course is not true. You know, the Zionists, you know, my grandparents' generation, they, they went to Palestine because they were Zionists. Um, 
they, were, they wanted to go as far away as possible from Judaism and, for, and from religion. They had wanted nothing to do with, or with Jewish orthodoxy. Um, they wanted to, and they created this myth that Jews are a people as opposed to members of a religion. And they created another myth, or this same, part of the same myth, that the Bible is not a religious document, I'm talking about the Old Testament, but it is our history book. And the third leg of the myth is that Palestine is our homeland. And that is the, that's what Zionism, these are the three pillars that Zionism rests on. Now look at the color of my skin and tell me if you think I came from Palestine. My ancestors came from Palestine. Okay, my ancestors came from somewhere in the Ukraine. But this is what Zionism rests on. And of course, they were very secular and not only Orthodox religious Jews, but most Jews rejected this crazy idea. Most Jews rejected Zionism and eventually, you know, for all kinds of different reasons, it became more acceptable. Um, now, today, it's very, there's a very interesting process where Jew, Orthodox Jews or certain groups within the Orthodox Jewish community are warming up to Zionism and even becoming very Zionists and happy to serve in the army and become settlers and so on while other Orthodox groups are out in the streets saying we will never serve in your army. So there's, the, 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 you can understand why there might be a misunderstanding here but this is the reality and the more Orthodox and the more deeply Jewish people are, of course, the more they resent this idea that Zionism represents Jews. Because it doesn't. It represents a small group of, of, of zealots, really. And last, it um, was in the spring, when the, the APAC convention took place in DC, I was there, and there were a lot of people there protesting on the outside. And there's a, small, there's a group of rabbis um, that come from New York. They're, you know, deeply, deeply orthodox, ultra-orthodox rabbi, Neturi Karta, and they show up at all these protests. And the rabbi stood up and spoke. And usually when people bring up the Holocaust, you think, oh, not again. The way he brought it up was the most moving expression I've ever seen of anybody bring up the Holocaust. He said, my grandparents died in, Aus died in Auschwitz. How dare they use their memory to justify their crimes. They meaning Israel. You know, and I've never seen anybody cry it out quite so, in such quite, quite a moving way. And he's a deeply orthodox Jewish man, and of course he sees Zionism as, as, as a terrible, terrible crime. So that's kind of the, you know, that reality. You want to do some more? Okay, um, well, The Lemon Tree is a Lemon Tree, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice book. I know, the, you know, I know the author, I met him several times. Um, I will say, since you, talked about an unbiased view. I usually preface my lectures, but for some reason tonight I didn't. I usually preface my lectures by, with a disclaimer saying that if anybody was expecting a balanced presentation, they're going to be sorely disappointed. So perhaps I should have done this tonight. I apologize. I'm sorry that I didn't. My presentation is absolutely and clearly one-sided and unbalanced. Absolutely and clearly. And the reason for that is, and I, I think I said something about this uh, earlier, on the issue of colonialism and racism, there is no balanced option. You either oppose it or you support it. I have a great older Jewish friend, great activist, who always says, I oppose racism, what's your, what's your opinion? <laughs> there is no balanced option on the issue of Israel-Palestine. It is a, it is, it, the problem was caused by one side, perpetuated by one side, continues because of one side. The, the, the violence is, 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 is caused by one side. The weapons are on one side, the power is on one side, and the control is on one side. So I don't see how you could have a balanced presentation. So that is my bias, and this is, my pre this is, and this is the reality how I, and how I view it. And I actually very strongly doubt that anybody can present a balanced presentation on this issue. 
Everybody's got their bias, of course, but anybody who says that they're presenting a balanced presentation is either lying to themselves or lying to the audience because it doesn't exist. You know, you're either a racist or you're not, or you're against racism. That's it. And on this issue, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter if we're talking about blacks and whites, if we're talking about Palestinians or Israelis, or if we're talking about any other issue. I think it's very, very clear on this issue, and that's why my presentation is the way that it is. Um, so that's about the, the non-biased view. There's no such thing, I think, as a non-biased view. How do you make Americans care about anything? Well, you know, that is the... <laughs> that was basically your question, right? You know, what Israel was able to do... Actually, it wasn't Israel. It was before, even before the State of Israel was established. The Zionist movement had a... Today we would call it a, a PR machine or a PR team. Um, these were some very, very intelligent, highly educated, white men and maybe one woman, Golda Meir, who would travel around the world and convince the powers that be that Zionism is the right thing. And the powers that be liked it for many, many reasons. They liked it because perhaps their, their form of Christianity liked the idea of seeing the Jews return to, the, to their homeland. They believed in this literal reading of the Bible. Some of them thought, well, this would be a great idea because we can get the Jews out. So they liked that idea. They liked it for those reasons. For many different kind of reasons, they liked it. But the reason these people had an appeal is because they were very well educated, very well spoken. In fact, they all spoke five, six languages. My grandfather was one of them. And they would travel around the world and they would discuss the issues of the Jews in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, before there were any Jews there practically. I mean, when my grandfather started, I have a poster at home advertising a lecture my grandfather gave in Kiev in 1920. And it is, you know, Dr. Avraham Katznelson will speak about the issues of the Jews in the land of Israel. In 1920, there were maybe 20 Jews in the land of Israel, you know. There was a very small Jewish community in Palestine at the time. The, the Jewish community grew only a little bit later. So that, and they were very convincing and they were very strong. They were the beginning of what we know today as APAC. And they did a remarkable job in making it seem like there is nothing more important than supporting these poor Jews in their, to reach their homeland and then thrive in their homeland. And today in America, not only in America, but we're talking about America, when you look at the media, when you look at education, when you look at cultural events and, and basically the culture, they have managed to influence so many a aspects and facets of, of, of American life. You know, it's not to say, you know, the Jews are controlling the media. That's nonsense. What it is, it is the Israeli PR machine has managed to create a reality where you don't have to convince people that voting for Israel is the right thing because they've known it their whole lives. They saw it in their school books. They learned it in their churches. They saw it on TV. It's, they hear it in the news. Israel is the good guy. Israel is like us. And then look at what Arabs are, how Arabs are portrayed. Look at how Palestinians are portrayed. You know? So that comes before anything. Now, America, as I'm sure you know, is still a very segregated place. So if you're rich and white, you don't come across a lot of black or colored poor people. So it's a very easy sell, actually. Um, and you're right, Americans uh, don't care enough about issues of homelessness and issues of racism. And certainly in America, black lives don't matter. So, you know, we know that. That, is, that has proven to be the case for many, many years. But when you talk about Palestine, you, I mean, we talk about Israel, you talk about the Holy Land, it's so romantic, it's so wonderful. Let's give them money, let's support them, let's give them weapons. And now, of course, they're fighting our war because they are defeating the terrorists, and they've been defeating the terrorists all the time. You know? Uh, I remember after 9-11, somebody, somebody came up to me and said, now we all know what you go through. Now we are all like Israelis. And I'm thinking, you're out of your mind. <laughs> you know, you have no clue what you're talking about. But that is the narrative. And it started way back then, maybe a hundred or so years ago, and they have been very thorough and very diligent and very successful. That is what the Israeli lobby is about. It's not a bunch of guys with suits in, in Washington, D.C. You know, it's much, much deeper and much more thorough. And that's why the reality is the way it is today. 
uh, here in America. Um, well, the issue, like I said before, the issue, the, I'll start with the end. You know, the thing, the world vision thing is exactly like the Holy Land Foundation thing. The, any charity to, to Palestinians needs to be interpreted as terrorism because the narrative is the Holy Grail. The narrative which said that we the Jews have returned after 2,000 years and we were persecuted and by so many different people you know, throughout history and the Palestinians are not terrorists and they want to kill us and the Arabs are unreasonable and that's why they're trying to kill us and everybody's anti-Semitic and on and on and on. That is the narrative. Therefore, we are victims but we also have to be strong and we have nuclear weapons. <laughs> we maintain this narrative and we have to maintain this narrative for our existence. It is the Holy Grail. It is why people in Gaza are being killed. It is why World Vision is now, you know, this nonsense about the money going to Hamas. It is why the Holy Land Foundation had to be taken down. It is all for sake of the narrative. Because without the narrative, there is no legitimacy. The narrative is what gives Israel its legitimacy. And Israel has no legitimacy. The narrative is, a, is fake. It's a myth. We did not return after 2,000 years. I wasn't there two, after 2,000 years ago. And like I said, look at the color of my skin. My ancestors certainly didn't come from there. You know? Uh, and, so, and, and on and on and on. So that is why any charity to Palestinians has to be turned around and explained as terrorism. Now, how this develops, we'll see. It's, this is actually a very interesting case because World Vision is, is, is such a, is, is, it's not a Muslim organization. It's not an Arab organization. So we'll see what they do uh, and how this develops. Now, when we talk about terrorism, like I said, terrorism is an issue of whether someone's a terrorist or, or a freedom fighter. It's, an, it's a question of geography, I think. So um, we have to differentiate whether we're talking about organizations like Hamas, or Hezbollah, which I think are legitimate resistance organizations. Um, and whether we like their methods or we don't like their methods, they are legitimate resistance organizations that have a cause and are fighting for that cause. And if they were not Arab, and if they were not Muslim, then America would probably be supporting them. We talk about ISIS or all these other strange creatures that emerged. That's a whole other different story. When you create a vacuum, when you destroy a country, when you destroy a neighborhood, then the, you know, there's a certain element that rises to the top. That's the reality. You know, that's the reality. Somebody's going to fill the void. If there is no government, if there is no police forces, there is no, if, if you destroy the system completely, then somebody else is going to rise to the top. It's like people, you know, San Diego, where I live, has, is a huge Iraqi community. A lot of refugees are settled in San Diego because the weather's nice. And, well, and, I've, and I met a lot of them. And whether you talk to Shia Muslims or Sunni Muslims or Chaldeans or other Christians, all say the exact same thing. They wish Saddam was back. They wish Saddam Hussein was back. They say we had one Saddam Hussein. Now we have a thousand Saddam Husseins. Every neighborhood has a Saddam Hussein. During Saddam, women could walk freely, they didn't have to cover themselves, you could go out, the education was good, health care, you know, there was a system that worked. Politically, it was, you know, a vicious dictatorship. Not any worse than Saudi Arabia, our dear friend, or anything like that. But it worked. And regardless, and whether they're old, or young, or in between, or lived as refugees, any Iraqis that I've spoken to said, we wish Saddam was back. So, when you destroy an entire country and you destroy another system, then you've got all kinds of criminal elements come up. I don't think you have to be a, a genius or a sociologist to know that. And that is what this is. That's what all this ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Daesh and whatever it is. Um, who's, who's, who's exactly funding them? Who's arming them? These are all questions that are out there. I don't want to get into that. But I don't think that we should be furthering this narrative that legitimate resistance is comparable to these other groups because it's a completely different thing. It's a completely different kind of reality. Um, and in terms of how this affects the Israeli-Palestinian issue, as long as Arabs are killing Arabs, Israel is happy. 
because it shows how stable and democratic and wonderful Israel is and civilized, you know. So Israel is quite happy when, 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 uh, when there's chaos uh, in the Arab world. And I'm, I'm going to take the privilege here. Um, um, we've not had time to hear anything specific about uh, the individuals involved with the Holy Land Foundation. And I've had the privilege of, of reading some of this text. And, and so what I'd like you to do is share one story. And I'm actually thinking the story you told me earlier about Captain Phillips and Mufid, which I think might be a nice place to end. Okay. okay? So that's it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, has everybody here seen the movie Captain Phillips? Or at least familiar with the story? Anybody know? Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you, the, I'll give you the, the thing. And then I'll tell you why it's relevant. Okay, the, 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 the story of Captain Phillips, you, you may recall that several years ago there was this, um, you know, this, this issue of, of uh, big tankers and l large tankers, large boats, commercial uh, shipping were being, uh, high, were being um, what's the word? Um, hijacked, I suppose, by um, Somali pirates. Um, and what they would do is they would go out into the, into the ocean, they would hijack the tanker, take control over it, take it back to Somalia, get the ransom money from the insurance companies, and then release them. And they did this many, many, many times. And at one point, I guess, the US government decided they'd had enough. I guess the insurance companies had had enough. And they sent the Navy SEALs. And this one particular case, which the movie Captain Phillips uh, was about, they, uh, the Navy SEALs intervened. They uh, killed the so-called pirates. These are young Somalis, you know, basically with a rickety little boat and AK-47s. And they arrested the captain, who was a 16-year-old Somali kid. He was sentenced, for some reason, they, the judge decided they were going to try him as an adult, even though it wasn't clear that he was 18. And he was given 34 years in prison. And he is at a special prison called Guantanamo North. That's what it's nicknamed. It's called the Communication Management Unit. It's a special prison that was created for terrorists in, in the US. There's one in Terre Haute, Indiana, and one in Marion, Illinois. And he's in the one in Terre Haute, Indiana. Now, why do I know this? The, the, the story of the Holy Land Foundation has so many facets and has opened my eyes to so many facets of, of, of the prison system, of what it's like to be Muslims in the prison system, of what it likes to be you know, terrorists in the, Muslims, in, in the prison system, and so forth. So um, one of the gentlemen who's in prison about which I'm writing, Mufid Abdul Qadir, uh, I visited him a couple of weeks ago a week and a half ago, actually, in, uh, in, his, in prison. He's in uh, Kentucky now. Never mind. They move them from prison to prison all the time. And he told me that two weeks earlier, his wife received a letter from this kid who was the so-called captain of the ship, the Somali kid, who was with him in the prison. Mufid was in that prison with him. Why did she, what was the letter about? Well, when this kid came to the prison, Imagine a kid who is, his entire life was homeless. From the age of six or seven, he was a child soldier. At some point, when he was 14, 15, he figured out how to work the GPS, go out in the big ocean, bring in these big tankers, and collect millions of dollars. He never went to school in his life. Of course, the millions of dollars went up the chain of command to some warlord. Um, that's what he did. So he was brought into this Guantanamo type prison here in the United States. Um, nobody on the outside world that he can communicate with. His mother lives in Somalia and he can't call her on the phone. You know, prisoners can use have several minutes you know, a week that they can talk on the phone. He's got nobody to talk to. Uh, he's going mad. He's going crazy. He's misbehaving. So of course the prison authorities decide to sedate him because he's too wild. Anyway, Mufid, who is one of the characters in my book, takes him under his wing. And he says, look, if you die in prison, nobody cares. You're nothing. You're a little black terrorist. If you die, you die. It's one mouth less for them to feed. Is that what you want? 
Keep doing what you're doing. But here's another option. I will teach you, and you can get your ESL, your English as a Second Language Certificate. The, you know, the short version is, finally he agreed, and he went ahead and taught him, and he got his ESL. Once he got his ESL, Bufit said, okay, now we're going to get you your GED. You know, the guy is screaming and shouting. Of course, Mufid is a very convincing, very warm, loving guy, very fatherly kind. A guy takes him under his wing and starts preparing him for his GED. The kid's never been to school, barely speaks English. And then Mufid was uh, sent away to a different prison. When I met him two weeks ago, his wife called him and said, this young boy, his name is Musa Abduwali, sent his wife a letter, a thank you letter, and a copy of his GED certificate to thank this guy. And then she tried to send Mufid the letter, but you can't send a letter about one prisoner to another prisoner. So it was sent back, but I got a copy of the letter. It's a very moving, very poorly written, of course, his English is terrible, but very moving letter saying thank you to his, you know, his big brother Mufid for taking him through. And now he wants to continue going to college and he wants to study engineering and all and so on. So it completely changed this guy's life. And so, so I think the reason we're talking about this story is just to demonstrate, number one, what kind of potential these people have. What kind of warm, wonderful people we threw in jail for the rest of their lives. And how much we are losing by having these guys there. And basically, you know, this, uh, the, the, the human potential that exists that we have shunned away from ourselves, from society, is tremendous. And my hope, uh, and I hope I can do this with Doug's help, is that this book will, you know, illuminate some of this and change some minds and bring and really create a reality where people demand that these people be set free. Anyway, thank you all.